This is the 2023 Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. And welcome back to our Junior Piano Competition and Festival. This is the first and only day of the finals, and really it's the last day of this competition. We'll have the awards tonight. I'm Buddy Bray, I'm your host for the webcast. I'm your co-host Daniel Shu, and we are broadcasting live from Meyerson Symphony Center, home of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, right here in Dallas, Texas. And remember, you can see a list of names of all the competitors, all the repertoire they've played, and their bios at Clyburn.org. Another fun thing you can do at Clyburn.org is to vote for your favorite as an audience member. Just surf on over to where it says Audience Award. And yet another thing you can do online is to visit any performance from this competition. All of those performances are archived on Clyburn's YouTube channel, or you can also see them in 4K HDR and enhanced audio on hi-fi.com. As this competition comes to a close, don't forget to continue to follow the careers of these young artists. Check out the Clyburn social media platforms for more information about them and the competition and festival. And as this competition comes to a close, the pressure undoubtedly ratchets up on these three young guys. Do Absolutely. you remember what it was like in the finals, like you're, the day you were gonna play the Tchaikovsky? What did you feel like? I remember it being a blur. I just remember only being able to focus on the monumental task ahead mm -hmm. of me. Um, the pressure really builds to this point and kind of the moment of pacing around backstage before <laughs> you walk out is something I won't forget for a very long time. So. You, you talked about focus. Is, is focus something you have to learn? Is focus a discipline that you become better at, do you think? Absolutely. It is always a learning process. I try to find better ways to focus and uh, different ways to keep myself focused. Um, so it's, it's really kind of incredible to see these young these young artists really mm -hmm. uh, take on such a big moment in their careers. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you talked about pacing around backstage. I have always been a big pacer around her as well. <laughs> pacer. So what do you think that does for us? For, for me, it's calming, but I don't know why. I'm exactly the same as you. I drive everybody absolutely insane with the amount of pacing mm -hmm. I do. That's the only way I can kind of ignore the noise and just focus on what it is I have to do. Helps me think, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I'm glad I'm not the only one. Are you going through the music when you're pacing around? Yeah. I'm sometimes doing yep. that as well. We don't know what our first young competitor is doing backstage, but we are sure he is pretty focused. He's been that way throughout the competition. He even drew the unlucky number one to play first in this piano competition all these days ago, but he has made it to the finals. He is 16-year-old Chechen pianist Jan Schulmeister. Take a look at this bio. And I'm from Czech Republic and I'm 16 years old. I'm the sixth generation of musicians. My mom is a pianist at the conservatory and she's at the same time my teacher. I practice about uh, five hours a day. In Czech Republic, we have a specific uh, type of school. So I have um, lessons through the whole day, and between that lessons, I have a free time for practicing. Well, I'm looking just to enjoy it, to make wonderful music and to, to make new friends and so on. Jan Schulmeister is shortly to take the stage here at the Morton H. Meyerson Symphony Center. He'll be playing the Saint-Saëns Piano Concerto Number no. 2 in G minor with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and guest conductor Valentina Peleggi. Daniel, we've talked about this Saint-Saëns Concerto being a great thing to play right at the very beginning. You can sort of get your nerves out because you can sound good 
right away on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. The Tchaikovsky is a little bit that way itself because you have these beautiful chords. They're all over the piano, but you sound good right away. So does that work? Does that get your nerves out or did it that day? I don't know if it did that day, but it certainly <laughs> helped so much. Just getting on stage, sitting there and getting right into it helps with the nerves to kind of get yourself into the moment and to get yourself feeling things as you get on. We're going to take you to the stage right now for some opening remarks by President and CEO Jacques Marquis. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to this third edition of the Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. My name is Jacques Marquis, I'm the President and CEO of the Clyburn, and we are delighted to be here in Dallas at the Meyerson with this great orchestra. We had 248 applications of young, exceptional pianists between 13 and 17 years old. From these 248 pianists, 30, 23 came to the competition, and we had more came for learning experience. And we have tonight, after they played almost two hours of music already, three finalists. We started this competition of thinking, we're gonna give them a platform, a learning experience, inspire them to do what they love the most. And actually, they inspired us. Please welcome the young juniors and Valentina Pelleggi and the DSO. Thank you. Our first competitor this evening is 16 years old and hails from Czechia. Today he'll be performing the Saisons Piano Concerto No. 2 in G minor. Please welcome to the stage Jan Schulmeister and conductor Valentina Pelleggi.
big ovation for you. You're at the finals of the 2023 Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. Welcome back to the webcast. Jan Schulmeister was, of course, playing Sanson's Piano Concerto No. 2 with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and guest conductor Valentina Pelleggi. And, of course, he was giving lie again to the notion that if you pick number one at the draw party, that's it for you. Here he is in the finals. Brilliant performance, I thought. Really assured, very mm. confident, and, you know, he really went for it. And I, you know, it's super amazing to see that from Jan today. Mm -hmm. I think he also connected with the audience really well in the second movement, which yeah, needs, to, needs to get a little bit of laugh from the audience at the end absolutely. of it. He, he got that plus applause. Yeah, what more can you ask of, for? At the end of the second movement. <laughs> the Sassons Piano Concerto Number no. 2 is, of course, a piece that was just sort of made for the piano. I think Sassons knew exactly what he was doing in constructing the piece because it, it fits so well. Here, once you learn it, of course. <laughs> yeah, you know, lots, lots of great pattern, lots of comfortable things for the piano. I would say the only thing that I really dislike about the work is this middle part in the third movement with all of these trills, man, and you have to know the right keys to play when, and you gotta put them in the right order. It is a treacherous, treacherous place. Really a dangerous spot. We're gonna go to stage right now for our next competitor, Yifan Wu, 14 years old from China. He'll be playing the Chopin E minor piano concerto with the Dallas Symphony and guest conductor Valentina Pelleggi. Here is 14-year-old Yifan Wu.
That's 14-year-old Chinese pianist Yifan Wu accepting a lot of applause from this very friendly Dallas audience today at the Morton H. Meyerson Symphony Center after his brilliant performance of Chopin's E minor piano concerto, concerto number no. one, with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and guest conductor Valentina Peleggi. Now, Daniel, I saw you playing along with him a little bit. You couldn't help it. I mean, it's one of your pieces too, yes, right? So I, you can't help but do some air piano when he's playing. It's hard. It's hard not to do it. Um, he's sounding so great out there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful crystal lines. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful flashes of brilliance all mm -hmm. over the work. And you know, a piece that you don't get to hear very often at this stage of competition. That's right. I wonder why that is. Do you have any thoughts on it? Well, I would say typically you get a little more of the Rachmaninoff, <laughs> Liszt, Tchaikovsky mm -hmm. types. So it's really great to see a little bit of variety. Mm -hmm. um, some Chopin. Get some Chopin in the mix. Um, it's a little bit on the longer side mm -hmm. and very piano heavy, but still a wonderful choice for him, mm -hmm. I thought. Piano heavy is good for this, right? Yeah. But speaking of heaviness, it's really interesting to, to have a piece like this, and we talked about this a little the other night when, when a couple of them were playing Saint-Saëns. It's, it's very difficult in a large theater to pull off a leggero, a light touch, because you have to play a little louder, and once you do that, then how do you play lightly? How do you play loud and light at the same time? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of a question that one of the festival participants asked of John Kimura Parker. And um, it's a tough thing, especially in a big hall with an orchestra. You just have to have somebody you trust out there to help mm -hmm. you guide, guide your way through. Get, get some balance tips yeah, from outside. We didn't have a chance to acquaint you with Yifan before he played. So here's a little info about him from his own mouth. Take a look. I'm Yifan Wu. I'm 14 years old. I come from Shanghai, China. I really like sports, uh, table tennis, badminton, and uh, cycling. I studied a few plays uh, for three years, three years, yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I want to challenge. <laughs> Junior competition is, uh, I, I think, uh, is the best of, of any other, uh, it's better than any other junior competition. I'm very excited to show my music to all my audience. Fourteen-year-old Chinese pianist Yi Fan Wu, who has just played in the finals of the 2023 edition of Clyburn Junior. Remember, you can see a list of all the competitors, their repertoire, and and the times they played, and all that, their bios, all that, at Clyburn.org. Another thing you can do at Clyburn.org is vote for your favorite as an audience member. There's a special place to do that on the website as well. Remember also that all performances from this competition are archived now and can be viewed on the Clyburn's YouTube channel or a little bit more enhanced audio and video experience at hi-fi.com. Don't forget to check out the Clyburn's other social media channels to find out more about the competition, the competitors, and everything else we're doing to spread classical music around the world. Now the audience here at the Meyerson Symphony Center in Dallas is checking out the gift shop, or at least we hope they are, in this intermission segment. There's some great stuff in the gift shop this year. There's a, a blue frisbee. There's a fanny pack that you really liked. There's a gray hoodie this time. Maybe we could Which exchange. Which I have to steal. Okay, you will. You'll yeah. be stealing it. There's some great new ties, a lot of good stuff. The Panda Bear, all this good stuff at the Clyburn gift shop. And you can shop at home. Just scan that QR code on your screen or go to shop.clyburn.org. In a moment, we're gonna be joined by Clyburn President and CEO Jacques Marquis. But just before that, we thought you'd like a, to take a look at the legend himself. Here's a portrait of Van Clyburn. In 1958, Cold War tensions were at their absolute height. Nuclear annihilation was a constant concern. 
It was against this backdrop of mutual anxiety and suspense that Texas's Van Cliburn emerged, not only winning the first Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow, but ushering in the possibility for a new generation of cultural exchange between the East and the West. The Soviets at that time had just excelled in space and at the Olympics with gold medals, and uh, they said, uh, we can even do it in the arts too. That such a competition would be won by an American, and that's what happened. Van went there. He won over the Russian public. He won over the judges. He played like an angel. I interviewed uh, Vera Gornostaiva, who was a revered teacher at the Moscow Conservatory. And I have a picture in my book of her pointing to her heart. And that was in response to my question, what distinguished Van's playing? And I remember perfectly well how barely my father and mother squeezed me, squeezed me through the crowd uh, because there were no tickets. And I sat on my father's lap and heard Van play Tchaikovsky first piano concert. So Van Cliver came to Russia and brought them back some, uh, some fantasy uh, which Russians lost during this so many tragedies which uh, Russian, Russians went through. I mean, now we refer to him as President Bush, but he was George then. I mean, he said, you know, we're opening the ballpark, and uh, I would like to do something special. Do you have any suggestions? And I said, well, I think one of the best things you could do would be to have Van Cliburn pay, play the national anthem. And he said, well, Van's not gonna do that. He wouldn't do something like that for, you know, for a, a baseball game. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to perform our national anthem on opening day at the ballpark in Arlington. Please welcome Texas's own Van Cliburn. Joined by the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Maestro John Giordano. Crazy? It's crazy. And I mean, all of a sudden he stops and he gets up and he grabs the microphone. Oh, say, you know, there it is. I'm Jacques Marquis, I'm the president and CEO of the Clyburn. And we're here today at Carruth Auditorium on the campus of SMU in Dallas for the beginning of the Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. One of the key thing of this junior competition is they are between 13 and 17 years old and we want this to be a learning journey for them. We're here in the Caruth Auditorium where we'll have the first three rounds of the competition. It's a great hall, perfect for recital. They will all play on this very nice Steinway D. The jury will be here, and we have nine members of the jury coming from all over the world. And from round to round, they will decide who they want to listen again in the next round. The system is very simple. It's a yes-no process without deliberation and discussion. We have the practice rooms and you can hear some of them practicing already. 
like I said before, they practice a lot and they've been practicing a lot. To prepare for a competition of that level, they have to practice. Piano is a very solo instrument and they come here and we, we bring them together as a collaborative camp. They will leave with friendships, new knowledge, new ideas, and we'll see how they can blossom through that. The competition itself is not a finality. It's we're trying to not close any windows. We try to open them all. Welcome back to the webcast. That man you see walking and talking in the video you just saw is Jacques Marquis, president and CEO of the Clyburn and whose brainchild this junior competition is. Tell us first, why the junior? How did you have the idea? The idea came in uh, 2013 when I watched the, the main Clyburn, the professional one, and seeing the kids, the young pianists getting younger and younger and younger, <laughs> and if they're good at 22, they must be amazing at 15. <laughs> Make sense? That has proven to be true. And yeah. you have all sorts of events. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the webcast, the, the festival events as well. An important part, you know competitions are perceived as being sometimes cruel, perceived only. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it was important that this junior uh, help competitors to have a platform, mm -hmm. but at the same time a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Then we do workshops with them and, and master classes and, and other symposium and all about music. We don't close any doors. I've noticed, uh, I think you did one, Daniel. Didn't you do an artist talk with the kids? I did. We had Very a fun. inspiring. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's, that's all I do around here. Uh, we also had we a fun. We brought you here to inspire. We also had a fun uh, workshop together yep. um, on stage crafts and presenting yourself to audiences and uh, what to say, what not to say, and all, lot, lots of fun stuff, right? Mm -hmm. What's happening from the door to the piano? The it's an important, it's an important transition. How right? you do that? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how you say hello. I'm watching them. Are you saying hello to the conductor? Are you saying hello to the concert master? Are you bowing with your feet together? It's that first impression, yep. right? Absolutely. The audience sees you the first time. Tell us a little bit about how you put a jury together, because it's it's one of the most important things, of course, always, always. in a competition. Tell us what your thinking is behind that, because they always have a great time here. We try to, to have, first, a, a happy jury is a good jury. They <laughs> exactly. vote well. We feed them well. <laughs> but, but also, I, I bring people of different places in the world, and I'm trying to find a good balance in age, nationality, also from different countries, then the, 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 the halls in the, uh, Europe are not the same than the same halls in the US, and the aesthetism in, in Japan is not the same here. Then at one point we, we can get a, a feeling that we have all a good blend, and my job after that, after that is to make sure that the blend gets together. But, the, but you do make sure of that. And you know, I was watching some festival events this week and you lapse into dad mode like I call it yeah. during the during the festival especially during those artist talks because somebody will say something that you find particularly cogent and you'll say did you hear that did everybody hear that yeah. say it again yeah so yeah. we can hear oh that I again. will shut down some but <laughs> but you know I do my dad thing but it's in order to that everybody has a good experience not everybody is a big talker the mm. other one are more silent then I'm managing. Well, yeah. you are, and you're good at being a dad anyway. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the voting. Everybody's always curious yeah. about voting, and what everybody's always surprised at, both in the audience and out in webcast land, is how fast the voting happens, and also that if you say that the results are going to be at a certain time, that is when they happen. So how do you make sure that happens, and what's your system there? The system is, first, there's no discussion, no deliberation. Mm -hmm. It's a yes-no process. Then you have like 23 candidates, you go for 12. It's a yes-no process, there's no discussion. You circle 12 names, you put some maybes there to, in case of ties, and we move on. Mm -hmm. Then it's pretty fast and it's silent. <laughs> Everybody is working on their sheets, 
they give the sheets, we compile the votes, and we announce the result and we move, move on. And it's, yeah, it happens great. It happens, it works great every time. Yep. Look, look what happened when we got Daniel. We, we got, got Daniel, Daniel out of that process. Exactly. That process. Yeah. All right, the bells sort of tell us that yes. the intermission time is getting short here, but we did want to talk a little bit more about the festival, so we put this video together for you. Here's just a little bit more about the festival that goes with this competition. Take a look. When we created the Junior, the important thing was that it was a learning experience for the young pianist. The Clyburn Junior is not only a competition, it's also a festival. Jacques Marquis thought it was super important for there to be this educational and sort of social aspect. Master classes, community concerts, seminars, workshop on stagecraft, social media, career strategy, etiquette. They have access to these really great people. The Artistic Director of Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center, Wuhan, came in and talked for a couple of days. The Clyburn has always been in my mind. As a pianist, this is the most admired competition. I'm here because I love music. My hope for these young musicians is they will continue to love music. There are performance opportunities. It's not just a lab. Concerts here on the campus. And then there are these community events in which you're playing for a, a wholly different kind of audience. But that's another teaching moment because a lot of what you do as a musician is in trying to attract an audience. It's different than when you practice in your practice room or even play for your teacher. To have these extra performances opportunity in many, many different venues, nothing like experience. Special organization like the Clyburns that makes a tremendous amount of difference and impact to see the community gather together to support classical music, to see the encouragement um, they have invest into the future generation and the, the energy and the love they instill in these young musicians gives me such joy and hope knowing that classical music will have a great future. I've said a lot that this is one of the happiest things we do and it might be the very happiest thing that we do. A festival like this provide them the environment that they can be around like-minded kids. It's a community that are incredibly supportive. You know, when you see so many talent in one place, you just want to make sure that you provide them the opportunity because you know they will make the world a better place. We create an atmosphere of, of sharing and learning. Welcome back to the webcast, and we are shortly to see our final performance of this final round of the Clyburn 2023. It went kind of fast, don't you think? I can't believe we're at the last performance. <laughs> it's been a, an incredible weeks, weeks of performances mm -hmm. from everybody, from all these incredibly mm -hmm. young, I want to say kids, but these are, these are young artists, really. I, it's, it's hard, right? It's sort of a paradox. They are kids, but they are also these fantastic pianists. The last one is 15-year-old Suk Young Hong from South Korea. Let's take a look at him. I'm Seo Kyung Hong, and I'm from South Korea. I'm a sophomore in a high school, um, and I'm 15 years old. I try to practice at least four hours. If I practice a lot, then I go like 10 or even more hours. My mom bought me an upright piano when I was like five, and she taught me actually. I started to compose when I was about eight, and I still compose. My teacher recommended lots of competition, and I specifically chose this one because 
In the senior competition, the most newest two winners are both from South Korea. That's Suk Young Hong, who's shortly to take the stage here with Dallas Symphony and guest conductor Valentina Pileggi. And together they will perform in this final round Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini, which is a banger. It's a great way to, great way to end this, a great way to celebrate the end mm -hmm. of this, these weeks of festivities. Mm -hmm. And it's so much fun and um, there's so much fire and drama and just wonderful, wonderful moments all throughout the work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm really excited. I think it's perfect for a competition, this piece, right? Absolutely. It, it shows you everything because the, the mood sort of turns on a dime. There are 24-ish variations, That's right? That's right. Um, and so it shows you the full range of, of what the pianist can do. do. And Seok Young can do it all, truly. <laughs> and, you know, this work is challenging in a competition. The interplay between soloists and orchestra is tough, mm. but I'm really excited for this, and I think it's going to be great. I am too. Let's talk a little bit more about that, that interplay between yeah. soloist and orchestra, because that is the kind of thing where rehearsal time comes in handy, right? Absolutely. If you, if you have this sort of delicate interplay, and sometimes it is, right. it takes a little while to rehearse it, it seems to me. Yeah. You know, you need the time together. You need, you need to come to the room, come to the table together, mm -hmm. and, you know, find that balance uh, between soloist and orchestra. But, you know, these kids, they have a very limited amount of time. Yeah. It's just, they really got to get it going. It's sort of hair raising. And speaking of hair raising, here he is, Suk Young Hong, 15 years old from South Korea, in Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini with the Dallas Symphony and Valentina Pelic.
Great applause for all three of our young finalists today. They were all three on the stage, Jan Schulmeister, Yif Han Wu, and of course, Suk Yong Hong, who just finished a great, great performance of Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini, accompanied by Valentina Pelleggi and the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Welcome back to the webcast. I'm Buddy Bray here with Daniel Shu. And Daniel, we have some time now to recap all three of these performances finally. Yeah. So we started the day with a performance of Sans House 2 yes. from Jan Schulmeister, who again drew that unlucky number one in the first round, but it served him well. It it's, served him well. Listen, if this is the luck that number one brings, we should all be uh, trying to draw number one. Maybe he'll maybe he'll cancel that. Maybe yeah. he'll cancel he'll that. He'll reset the whole stigma here. Um, really I was he came out guns blazing, not literally, <laughs> but, you know, just super confident, really from the first note, mm -hmm. bringing out all the, the mood and the essence of the work right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought he really nailed it today. We've got a little film on him. Take a look at this. Here's Jan Schulmeister in the finals. Jan Schulmeister in the finals of this 2023 Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. That's some footage of him playing Sansons Concerto Number no. 2 with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and Valentina Pelleggi. He has something in common with Van Clyburn, and that is Jan studies piano with his mom, yeah. which Van also did until college, until he went off to Juilliard. His mother was his piano teacher. That's really Worked incredible. well for Van. It's working not badly for Jan Schulmeister working either out great, yeah. today. Um, talk to us a little bit about what concert, how, what kind of process you always use to pick concertos. 
for competitions. Oh, yeah. It's a slippery slope, right? It's, it really is. Mm -hmm. I think it's a balance of a lot of different things. My personal belief is if you're going to go to a competition, you have to be playing the things that you feel the strongest connection to mm -hmm. uh, and the things that you love the most because I think that really, really translates mm -hmm. on the stage. Unfortunately, it can't be that simple. <laughs> you kind of have to balance what are what are am I do I feel comfortable with this piece have I played this piece long enough mm -hmm. so that when I'm under pressure I'm still gonna remember all the passages mm -hmm. um, you have to think about other practical things like is everybody playing this concerto mm -hmm. is this too popular am mm -hmm. I just another one of six playing mm -hmm. it um, there are a lot of different considerations to make and I thought Today, we got a pretty good variety of concertos. We really did. Uh, the Sassons, I thought, was a really, really good choice for Jan Schulmeister in that it has passages of great lyricism, yeah. and all throughout the competition, he has really leaned into his lyrical playing. The, the Janacek, the first movement, the Janacek sonata he did uh, earlier on, really showed us that sort of poetic side of him, and there were chances to do that in the Sassons, particularly in the first movement. But then, in the second and third, of course, you have to uh, bring the leggero and you have yeah. to bring the fire yeah. in the third movement. And of course, there is that treacherous passage in the third movement. What makes that so treacherous, do you think? Because yeah. we both said it at the same time <laughs> off camera. Oh, here it comes. Well, what, what is that about, do you think? Well, you know, it's just a really tricky spot. It's, it's a spot that you can easily fall into and sort of lose your place. Uh, there, there's a lot of similarities between the different repetitions, and if you're not careful, you end up in the wrong place. So, like you've taken a wrong turn. Absolutely, you can and do that. Mm -hmm. you know, in a concerto performance on a stage like this, you can't be making U turns and coming around. It just <laughs> it doesn't. Quite there isn't work. a place for that. And he did it. He did it great. I mean, we, we are not. We are not saying. Um, that, that he messed up anything. He didn't. He did that passage great, but it is very treacherous. And also, the orchestra always seems to be coming in uh, to your ear. The orchestra is coming in in the wrong place or yeah, on absolutely. the wrong chord or something like that. So it doesn't yeah. quite, it's hard to keep your focus during that passage. It really is. Mm -hmm. I, I like to call that passage the close your eyes and trust. Trust the practice passage. <laughs> he also did a, 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 a cool thing with, with fingering there, which the, the only two times I played it, I did the same thing. I think Sensal's meant for the whole passage to be played with alternating hands. Dun, 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 bum, dun, 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 like that. Yeah. But he split the hands always. I always did it because my left hand trills are not very good. Uh, he might have done it for a different reason. reason. Mm -hmm. I did it. I did a questionable thing, which I play all the trills with one hand. Oh. I'm not sure awesome, why. Awesome. But I'm well, always it works that for way. you. It works I, for you. I think I, I probably come from the same school of reasoning that you do, which is like, oh, left hand trill is high. <laughs> Pass on that one. I'll just do them all with the right. But yeah. Let's talk about that second movement, too, because that's what he played uh, a couple of nights ago yeah. in, the, in the last round of semifinals. And the, the second movement is very telling in Absolutely. a way, I think, because you have to bring that leggero, and there are some pitfalls in there, too. Yeah, it, it's tough because you get a very short or orchestra intro, and it's really on you to set, set the mood, set the mm -hmm. vibe, mm -hmm. set the tempo, set the character, set the lightness. I think the orchestra gives you just a bit and kind of pushes you out, mm -hmm. and you have to just immediately launch mm -hmm. into this character. Um, and you have to do that. I mean, you're absolutely right. I think you have to you have to set the tempo, you have to set the mood, you have to set the lightness, all that. And you have about one bar to do that. You, you right. must set it in the very first bar. Right. And to me, the temptation was always to play that very first E flat chord a little too loud. Yep. Uh, because you want to you want to get in. You, you want to get in and start. It's, it's nerve wracking a little bit, that first. Bit. Absolutely. Mm. And when you start it, this theme and this passage comes back multiple times throughout the movement and slightly different variations, slightly different forms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to be thinking about that from the start. You mm -hmm. can't, you need to set the character and you need to set the, set the tone for the movement, mm -hmm. but you can't give away the whole farm <laughs> in the first four bars of the work. Right, you can't. Uh, there are always, there are also some lightning fast scales oh, in yeah. that movement, oh, yeah. which I was always 
wanting to get to the end of that. That he was he was big on those the lightning fast scales in two hands. There's a there's a great passage or two passages in the in the organ symphony, mm. which are a four hand piano part, but they're big huge scales like that, <laughs> which are like harp glissandi almost, but only fingered scales for the piano, and they have to. It's a lot of notes in this much time. Quite literally, is, from the top of the keyboard <laughs> to the bottom. Right. It's just it's nerve wracking. He must have been a good pianist himself, though. Either that or he liked torturing people. Right. <laughs> or One or He was both. either <laughs> aspirational or liked torturing people. All right, we also heard from Yifan Wu playing the Chopin E minor concerto in this round. Interesting choice for a competition. Unusual which we've choice. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this a lot. Kind mm -hmm. of an unusual choice in competition, but a very welcome one. Um, I'd love to hear sort of this more emotional, this more poetic side of him today. Um, of course, he kept on with the signature brilliance mm -hmm. that the third movement calls for. Um, really, just a really strong performance from mm -hmm. him overall. And you know what I was thinking? We, we've talked a lot about how the Rachmaninoff has such sort of intricate interplay between the piano and the orchestra, but there are certainly moments in the Chopin concerto where the conductor and orchestra must be on top form. It's sort of like opera in a way. You yeah. have to you have to catch the pianist at the end of this sort of fioritura, coloratura, basically, yeah. and it has to all work just right, or else it just sounds bad. You know, <laughs> if, if, if it's not together, it just sounds bad. They did a great, great job with that today, I thought. But it, the second movement uh, makes me so think of Italian yeah. opera in a way. And it really does. And of course, Chopin loved that bel canto style, and there was nobody like him for the piano, right? I mean, there was just nobody like Chopin. There's a reason why so much of his work is played mm -hmm. um, and loved by pianists everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's just those lines and those incredible moments and um, just such great writing for the piano. Indeed. All right, we've got a little film of Yifan Wu from just a few minutes ago at the Flyburn 2023. Take a look. Yifan Wu, the 14-year-old Chinese pianist who played a brilliant performance of the Chopin Concerto No. 1, the E minor concerto. Of the two, I know you play both. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? It's a tough question. <laughs> I, think it's the, I think it's the E minor for me. There are moments of the F that I love mm -hmm. so much, mm -hmm. but I think in, 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 if you have to consider all the mm -hmm. movements and put everything together, uh, I'm, a, I'm impartial to the E minor. I always have been too, I don't really play either one, but but I've always been a better listener to the E minor. I think it grabs me right from the very beginning. It's Absolutely. the theme of the first movement. It already has me, and, and then the second theme also of the first movement sort uh, of is my, beguiling that's my personal favorite, yeah. to me. Uh, my teacher used to tell me that the F minor was a lot harder than it looked, actually. Mm. There was not much rest for the pianist in it, and it was a little bit more awkward than the E minor to yeah. play, he felt. Uh, but they are both, of course, masterworks of the piano. We heard after intermission, of course, from 15-year-old pianist Sakyong Hong from South Korea. At 15, he is the eldest of the three finalists. 15 years old, but he is the eldest of the three finalists in this edition of the Clyburn Junior. And he played, of course, the Rachmaninoff Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini. We just got through hearing it brilliant performance, but I do think he had a sort of interesting approach to the thing, which was it was not super fast all the time. Yeah, you know. It was unexpected. It was unexpected. We heard it a dazzling display from him with the Chopin mm -hmm. Opus 25 Etudes in the semifinals, so I was coming into this expecting just a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> gas Forward. pedal all the way down, <laughs> rolling through it, but mm -hmm. I was pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. He, and I, and I think, just to take another step back, I think it's very easy to do that in this moment. Mm -hmm. You're excited, mm -hmm. you feel the adrenaline, you're performing with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. for, in, in, in such a beautiful hall. Every, you have everything lined up mm -hmm. to just 
to take to the adrenaline go. and run, right. but mm. he didn't. Mm -hmm. He took a very, very measured, uh, thoughtful approach to the work, mm -hmm. and he brought out some really beautiful moments, and I think it, 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 it didn't run away from him mm -hmm. like so many performances of the work can, mm -hmm. can have. You know, um, what I was thinking, when he got to the very treacherous part, which is that F major yes. variation, where all of a sudden the orchestra's silent, and there you are, and you're playing a million notes very fast. I was not nervous for him in that yeah. moment, like I always am for other people, because sometimes you can hear it and you think it's about that close to going <laughs> right off the rails, um, but he didn't. He was always very sure, and it reminded me, in a way, of Van Cliburn's own approach to the piece, which was also a little bit stately, a little bit measured. So I think Van would have enjoyed this. Here's a little footage of Suk Young Hong, the 15-year-old South Korean pianist, in the final moments of the Rachmaninoff Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and Valentina Pelleggi. Welcome back to the webcast, and remember you can see a list of all the competitors, what they played, where they're from, and a lot of other great info just by going to Clyburn.org. The other thing you can do at Clyburn.org is to vote for your favorite. The Audience Award is super important. You can find that information at Clyburn.org. You can also see every performance from this competition. Everything will be archived on the Clyburn's YouTube channel. And then for a little bit different listening experience, you can go to hi-fi.com, where you'll view it in 4K HDR and hear it in enhanced audio. That's at hi-fi.com. Don't forget to continue, follow, continue to follow these young artists and their budding careers. Check out the Clyburn's social media pages for more information about the competitors, the competition, and the festival and everything about the Clyburn Junior. In just a few minutes, we're going to be joined by some of our friends from Texas Ballet Theater. They have been supporting the webcast this year through a generous donation from Ann T. and Robert M. Bass. The jury is now out voting for the awards. Daniel and I are going to be with you until the announcement of those awards at 6 p.m. And if you know Jacques Marquis, you know when he says 6 p.m., that is what he means, 6 p.m. We'll be staying with you until those results come in. As promised, in a moment, we're going to be joined by Tim O'Keefe and Vanessa Logan of Texas Ballet Theater. But first, we thought you'd like to check in with our friends Greg Anderson and Elizabeth Joy Rowe. Here's a performance of Leonard Bernstein's America that they recorded last year at the 2022 Van Cliburn International Piano Competition at the Van Cliburn Mural. Take a look.
Now, see, watching that spot, doesn't that make you want to subscribe to the Texas Ballet Theater? They're in both cities, Fort Worth and Dallas. And we are so happy at this break to be joined by the two leaders of Texas Ballet Theater. They are Vanessa Logan, who is the executive director, and Tim O'Keefe, who is the newly minted artistic director of Texas Ballet Theater. Welcome to you both. Thank you. It's so great to have you here. We're so, so happy to partner with Texas Ballet Theater on the webcast this year. Vanessa, if we could start sure. with you, and well, actually both of you, and we could talk about how that works, collaborative leadership. How does that work? Oh, well, that's a great question. So at Texas Ballet Theater, we have a co-leadership model, artistic director, Tim O'Keefe, executive director, myself. <laughs> And of course, our, our strategy is built by our Board of Governors um, and our senior leadership, both of our staffs. But from a co-leadership perspective, I look at it very much like a, a Venn diagram. So that we look at the core of the business and Tim and I talk about that, whether it's fundraising, marketing, sometimes programming. And then we have slivers that are we, we do on our own with our individual staffs, his artistic staff, my administrative staff. Mm -hmm. That's a quick 30 second that was pretty good. Concise. That was pretty good. <laughs> Excellent. And then, Tim, you are not new to the company. You are newly named artistic director, but you're certainly not new to the company, nor new to the ballets of, of Ben Stevenson. So tell us your history first with Texas Ballet Theater. I um, joined the company in uh, 2002 when I retired dancing from Houston Ballet. And uh, Ben asked me to come up, and we didn't know if he was going to be the artistic director yet. but. There was an interim year, and then he became the artistic director. And then, um, not only myself, but some other staff members and dancers uh, came up from Houston, and um, then the company uh, started to slowly change uh, into what we have today, mm -hmm. which is uh, a very strong classical and neoclassic company. Mm -hmm. It was um, in, a, in a different iteration when it was called Fort Worth Ballet. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a strongly sort of what you would, I think, call a mixed rep company. Where there weren't a lot of ballet evenings. There weren't a lot of ballet theater evenings. There were, it was a lot of Balanchine ballets, which were pure sure. dance a lot, a lot of the time. And then Texas Ballet Theater has become this place where you come and, and see something like Dracula, yes. for instance, or Beauty and the Beast, or Alice in Wonderland, all these really, really great things that that draw of an audience but you do also make strep evenings as well. well that's what is great about our company and i think what we bring to north texas is yes we we have the traditional ballets the story ballets the full-length ballets but we also have neoclassic works balanchine uh different uh choreographers from around the world and we also do contemporary works they, they might be on point they might be barefoot Mm -hmm. So we really try to um, give our audiences um, a full dance experience, and um, I think that's what uh, makes for us strong company and strong dancers. It certainly has been all this time. Let's talk about ballet in the community. You sure. know, as arts organizations, we are always we're always trying to leave a community footprint. We're always trying to be relevant in our communities. That's if we have any sense at all. We are going to try to be relevant in our communities. I know you do a lot of thinking about that, Vanessa. We do, we do. And I think, it, just to dovetail off what you just said, it's programming. It's to make sure that we have a story ballet for families, uh, a story ballet that might appeal to more a younger audience or a couple audience, and then our mixed reps, which are for, for everybody, but we'll also challenge people in what their perspective of ballet is. So bringing a community together, I mean, that's the purpose of live theater is to bring our community together and have this experience in, in a theater. Um, but from a community perspective, what I love about Texas Ballet Theater is our commitment to education. So we see over 50 schools in the Dallas and Fort Worth independent school districts uh, after school with free ballet classes. We have matinees that uh, get to uh, be enjoyed by about 30,000 throughout the Metroplex, 30,000 children. And that's important in, as far as a holistic education, because of course that's what we believe. Art is essential to a whole education. And of course, hopeful patrons later on as they grow up. Right. Let's talk about free ballet classes for a sure. minute. Because is that, 
you're giving a free ballet class and somebody's never had a ballet class before, that's their first experience, their first yes. interface with it? Yes, uh, we are grateful and thankful for so many funders who support this program that allow us to go in after school. Um, so it is in their school mm -hmm. um, and it is a Ballet 101, but it is also the same curriculum that we teach out of our beginners at um, either one of our facilities, this mm -hmm. facility of Texas Ballet Theater School in Dallas and our facility in Fort Worth. You know, it just takes so much staff. Really, it takes yeah. it takes so many people to keep a ballet company propped up, right? Yes. You know, you have to have the rehearsal directors. You have to have a full company of dancers, and that's another thing uh, that that happens with Texas Ballet Theater is that you expanded the um, the core de ballet. There, were, there was just a larger company than there, yes. there than there was um, in in times past. That takes a lot of money. Of course, it takes a lot of. Yes. How do you find dancers? How do you find dancers? Yeah. What's the process? Uh, we grow dancers in our own school, what <laughs> Vanessa was saying. There you um, go. That's what we do. I mean, it's uh, you are training um, someone from maybe the age of four or five and watching them progress mm -hmm. and how exciting that they can become a company member, rise through the company, mm -hmm. become a principal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's number one. And then we audition all over the country. Uh, for our summer intensive program, which is actually starting um, Monday uh, at TCU in Fort Worth. And um, so that's another big um, uh, draw for us, for dancers mm -hmm. from around the country. Um, we, uh, we audition for our company around the country, but we also uh, audition for the, our summer intensive. Mm -hmm. And we work with the kids, and it's a great way for us for the artistic staff to really work with new dancers that we haven't worked with before mm -hmm. and then offer them uh, a position, a traineeship or apprenticeship and, and then they start their way up into the company. You know what, I was just thinking, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, uh, but this competition was so great for you guys to partner with us because 13, 14, 15 years old, you're seeing exactly that age. And that's sort of exactly the age right when they need to decide if they're Correct. going to do this or not. Ballet is, you must start it young and you have to decide pretty young that you're going to or not, right? I mean, it, it seems like that to me. The dancers I've known in my life, some of them have never finished high school because they were, yeah. they were dancing. It's true. So that commitment is, is an early one and it talk about a commitment you know the, yeah. these kids have told us that they practice six or eight hours a day but a ballet commitment is at least that as well and you must I mean no matter what you feel like you get up and go to class you morning, always right? have class in the you morning always. no matter what, for the rest of your life you, you're gonna you, have you class. All, you always have class in the yeah. morning right and the sacrifices that come with that that don't feel like sacrifices because you love it so much and it is it is a calling I think for, for the artists that we've been watching here um, uh, through this competition. And, you know, when you were just talking about community, I was sharing with Tim, watching your, with the, the artists, the competitors, that, you know, I can see their coaches, their mentors, their family, their friends who are supporting them. Their community comes here to Dallas and Fort Worth, mm -hmm. just as our summer intensive students, their communities come. Mm -hmm. And gosh, how beautiful is that, is that we are connecting through these young artists and I, I just I think that's really special and something that I took away from the performance really extraordinary it's celebrating that youth and, and young people yeah. it's, it's pretty great yeah. I want to talk about next season starting with Dracula I think I have a personal experience with the ballet Dracula and we've, we've said this several times on the air that the the ballet evening is three acts yeah it's three acts uh, but there are big chunks of Liszt's Totentanz and other piano pieces in it, which I've had the pleasure to play many, many times with the company. Yes. Tim, I know you have quite a history with Dracula. Tell us about it. Well, um, in 1997, uh, the ballet premiered and I was Dracula. Ben created the mm -hmm. role on, on me, which was, I think it's the most uh, special experience a dancer can have is working with their artistic director and having a role created for mm -hmm. them. Um, I had worked with Ben for many years and he knew me. Uh, he knew how to tell the story with my, with my talents, my strengths, um, 
and it's just the piece is crafted to you and mm -hmm. it's you kind of feel sorry for the other people who have to do it <laughs> after you because it's created mm -hmm. on you and it, it, there's things that are that you can do maybe that other people are not very comfortable with mm -hmm. so and Ben's wonderful about that mm -hmm. he he um, makes you look great he's not going to give you something that doesn't make you look good and, and it's comfortable for you and so that it's it's a it's a wonderful experience to have and then um, the other wonderful experience is once you've done a part like that for many years and we did it for a long time and took it all over the world and is to um, have it come to Texas Ballet Theater Dracula and then be able to work with a new generation mm -hmm. of dancers and give back to them and say mm -hmm. look at this point right now, you're going to be totally exhausted. You better <laughs> learn how to conserve your energy right now. Go up that staircase and breathe because <laughs> you have a really hard body to coming up. <laughs> or just, you know, simple things like that, that that make a difference on then giving them the kind of the intensity level that that character needs to be at. And then the partnering challenges, the in, the secrets of how to make things easier. It's, that's very rewarding to be able to give back to somebody and then see them take it and then make it their own because mm -hmm. it's not you anymore, it's them. Mm -hmm. But just to be part of that and see them blossom in the role, is, it's wonderful. That is, that's the thing about ballet, which I think is so extraordinary, is that kids make a commitment to ballet and what a commitment it is. But there's a time span there with dancers. Yes. It will end. Uh, we don't face quite that same thing in music. We can play for a longer time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in many ways a, a, a musical commitment is more beguiling because there is not that telescoped amount of time. Um, Tim and his team do, and Ben really as well. I mean, Tim is a new artistic director, but been associate artistic director for so long, is looking at what would be the, the transition for our dancers because their their careers are short, shorter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but we have we have uh, many dancers now that are dancing past forty, and um, they're just brilliant and beautiful. But yeah. I think that's something really special about Texas Ballet Theater is looking at individuals and giving them choreography opportunities or costuming opportunities, mm -hmm. um, uh, education on production. I mean, so you can see Ben dancers sprinkled all over the world, not just. Um, on stage, but backstage too. One of them works for us at the Clyburn Sum too. We've tricked Robin Bangert into working for us on yes. it. <laughs> great, great at going into schools. You know, you just look at her personality and you know that she's going to be good at it. Yeah. You know, you were you were saying a minute ago, and I've just got to talk about this because you're saying, you know, a dancer coming on off stage just panting. It's something I've never been able to get used to in 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 playing for a dancer. If they come off stage. Um, out of breath, I think I've done something wrong in playing for them. It's like, oh no, they're just that. It's that's it's, just how it is. That's how difficult <laughs> the role is, or that's how aerobic the role is. Some, I mean, some things you can be the happy peasant and you can go over on the side and relax. <laughs> and with Dracula, it's so intense. Mm -hmm. Everything is a, uh, it's black and white, life and death. There's nothing. There, uh, when that character, it. it, it the energy level is so high and you have to know how to pace yourself mm -hmm. because you you need that intensity to be believable in mm -hmm. that part and uh, just yeah it's that's the experience um, of a dancer is playing so many different parts and being able to build on each mm -hmm. one and learn a little bit more about how to play different mm -hmm. roles mm -hmm. and how to successfully get through the ballet yeah. it's and it's building your stamina because when you're young you don't have that kind of stamina when I was older my body was challenged but my stamina was incredible and isn't that <laughs> sort of counterintuitive yeah. in a way yeah. that you would actually have more stamina rather than less yeah. at an older age because we think of you know 13 year olds yeah. and 14 year olds and we've seen them in the past you know, few days getting through just anything with incredible stamina. Okay, what else besides Dracula? That opens the season, but you've got other really great stuff. Ben's Nutcracker, which is uh, just a holiday tradition. Uh, we have so many people who enjoy this wonderful Nutcracker. We're doing that, of course. We have a mixed repertory program in the spring. Um, 
Val Canaparoli's Without Borders, which is probably the most contemporary piece. It's on point, but uh, to the Silk Road Project, uh, Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Project, uh, really interesting music, uh, challenging movement. We have two very classical pas de deux, um, Grand Pas Classique and Corsair pas de deux. Mm -hmm. And then we finish with um, Balanchine's Rubies. So you have contemporary on point, very classical and then neoclassic all in one evening. And then as you said, to finish the season, Lou Christensen's Beauty and the Beast, which is uh, to Tchaikovsky music, uh, very familiar music, um, but the charming tale of love and, you know, love conquers all. And it doesn't matter what you look like. And right, well, it's ballet, <laughs> it's right? Ballet. Yes. It's love, love conquers all in ballet. And what it brings to mind one of my favorite quotes by the soprano Renee Fleming, who was trying to explain the, uh, uh, the opera Rusalka to her friends. And she said, well, it's the Little Mermaid, but it's opera, so everybody dies. <laughs> in, <laughs> in ballet, not everybody dies, I, but there's love everywhere. Oh, I, saw, I saw her in Houston in that, that opera, mm -hmm. and I will never forget when she, that song to the moon. I, <laughs> it was just absolutely gorgeous. There's a reason she's Renee Fleming, oh, I know. for sure. <laughs> Okay, now this is a very exciting season that, that you've got going on. How do we subscribe to it? Uh, truly, just by going to our website, texasballettheater.org, and um, we have packages that are here in Dallas. Our, we're the resident ballet company of the Winspear Opera House, as well as Bass Performance Hall. And I think for our subscribers, what we're really seeing is Everybody's schedules are so full, but because we do a week here in Dallas and a week in Fort Worth, you can mix and match if you're a subscriber. So if it's more convenient from a calendar perspective to go when you're in Fort Worth or Dallas, you get to choose. Mm -hmm. And that's really a, a wonderful plus for You've our subscribers. You've thought of everything. How many Nutcracker performances do you do between the two cities? How many do you think there are? Uh, 26? 28 this 28? year. 28? We've There's added some. We've, we had to add more shows to our Dallas run because they were almost sold out last year. Wow. So, do you rotate the casting? Do you? Oh, that's a great question. There are all kinds of things built in, I'm sure, to <laughs> to double cast or triple cast. There or? can be up to seven or eight casts of the Nutcracker. So, uh, you will all you, probably in Act One you have three different parts that you do, and it's about the same for Act Two. So, anything more than that, then it gets too dysfunctional, but if you, you really, you, you could be doing a principal part, but then you might be doing the grandfather in the party scene as well as your principal part, and then a couple of variations in act two. So it's just, which makes it wonderful, and, it's, and Nutcracker is the time when our younger dancers get the opportunities to do principal parts, and um, it's the growth factor during a Nutcracker run is pretty amazing to see the dancers really start to um, hone their skills and get comfortable on the stage. It's, it's mm. where we have our most performances. And again, that's a commitment for children to commit to that many performances and a different yes. track each time. And yeah, that's really something. Our Texas Ballet Theater School get to audition. Um, so we have our Dallas school children um, perform here at the Winspear and our Fort Worth school children perform at Bass Performance Hall. It's a really wonderful, I did not, growing up in training in ballet, I did not have the opportunity to to be in a performance with professionals, and oh my gosh, what an extraordinary, our, our dancers are so beautiful with them as mentors and role models. It's really wonderful. It's great, looking forward to everything. Yeah. Vanessa Logan, Tim O'Keefe, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Here's a little bit more information about how to subscribe and what you get when you do so at Texas Ballet Theater, take a look. I guess every town has a flavor all its own. But this one seems to have more than most. Perched on the edge of the prairie, where it can never lose sight of its past and can see the 
future forever. Fort Worth, Texas, the unexpected city. So a piano is technically a percussion instrument. It's sort of a chain reaction of uh, striking. When a pianist plays the key, they set in motion a system of levers, which eventually catapults a piano hammer. It's just a felt-covered piece of wood that launches towards the strings, strikes the strings, sets them into vibration, and then that sets in motion the wooden soundboard underneath all the strings that creates uh, all this. It's important to prepare the piano because the pianist will be pushing it to its limits and need to be able to rely on it like a race car driver would rely on their car to win a race. It needs to be able to have warmth and also brilliance at fortissimo and a, a nice smooth gradient uh, in between those ex dynamic extremes. And then the strings are held in place by tuning pins. They're You just wrap it around a steel pin with a hole in it. Uh, it's very old world technology. Welcome back to the webcast. I'm Buddy Bray with my wingman here, Daniel Shu. We're going to talk a little bit about these competitors, these three fellows that were in the finals, in a little more depth because Daniel has, of course, been here since the semifinals. And we started the semifinals since Jan Schulmeister here drew number one, right. he played first in the semifinals, and that yes. was when we got that uh, Moment Musico. Yes. And yes. there are some, there are some really lyrical moments, the yeah. third and the fifth, and then the outer ones are just hard. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're just, it's virtuoso, and it's just hard. So I think you should play it, actually. I think it's a good piece for you. So just take a week and learn the six. Yeah, I'll be back music. next week. We'll have it at an impromptu special webcast, <laughs> and I'll, music we'll talk about it. But it was, I think, a perfect way to to showcase him because he yeah. loves to lean into that lyrical side of his playing. Here's Absolutely. just a little bit of Jan Schulmeister in Rachmaninoff's Momo Musical Op. 16. And Daniel, you weren't here for the preliminaries in the quarterfinals. We were really worried about you. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> but but Jan uh, did some really beautiful playing in the in those rounds too. Yeah. And I remember particularly in the quarterfinals where there is a requirement that the competitors play a lyrical work at Sesso in wow. in that language. Yeah. So he, he gave us two. He gave us the, the WC uh, Sunken Cathedral. Beautiful. And also the first movement of the Janacek E flat minor sonata. I always oh. call it, but um, from the street, it's uh, it's it's called. It was amazing playing. Yeah. And that lyrical. What is so hard about lyrical playing? Why would the Clyburn impose a requirement like that? And the Curtis Institute used to have that as an audition requirement. Two works by Chopin. Yeah. One brilliant. Yeah. The other lyrical. What what is so hard about lyrical playing? It's a great question. Um, I mean, it's slow. It looks slow. So why is it hard? You know, it's a trick question. It, it really is. You, you've really stumped me. On uh, the last day, we're waiting for we're waiting for the announcements. It's hard because I think it is more about yourself and how you express yourself and how you be vulnerable on the stage mm -hmm. in front of people. I think playing fast and loud, can you can get to a point where you play fast and loud well by practicing a lot, practicing really hard, having mm -hmm. a great teacher, having a lot of talent. But I think to take the next step and express something and to say something with music requires 
um, something deeper, something that comes from within you and isn't so much about the practice and the amount of hard work that comes in, mm -hmm. but more about how you relate to the music and what the mu music means to you and your ability to express that at mm -hmm. the keyboard. Nobody's said it quite that way yet that we've had on, and it's a great way to say it, and what it makes me think of is singers and how vulnerable singers very often feel because the voice is themselves, the is instrument that, yeah. is, is themselves, and also it's again, you're, you're trying to express sometimes an ineffable feeling or a feeling you cannot put into words and you have to express it through something lyrical, through a singing line. It's also just hard to sing on the piano, right? I mean, the piano's not really set up for that. Really. Right. You know, you hit the key, that's the loudest point, and it decays. And, you know, another aspect of this is the physical aspect of this where if you play loud and fast and you kind of hit the keys in the right timing, in the right order, you more or less get the right thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, singing at the piano and playing lyrically at the piano requires uh, a level of control of the keyboard and of the sound mm -hmm. that, uh, in my opinion, is far more difficult than playing quickly. Um, you know, my, my teacher, Gary Grafman, used to always tell me that I should not believe those people who say a, um, a, a, a continuous crescendo over a phrase is not possible. He used to tell me, don't believe the people that say the sound of the piano dies once you hit the note. And he said, if you sit at the piano and you work on it and you really, really believe in it, you'll be amazed by what you can do. Mm -hmm. And while it might not literally, physically be possible, mm -hmm. but that thought and that process can really, um, can really change how you approach the keyboard, mm -hmm. how you touch the next note, how you draw the sound of the piano. Mm -hmm. it, it's much more in depth than just a, a, a two bit uh, press mm -hmm. down and lift mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. There has been, or there have been, very few teachers and pianists who concentrated on sound and the possibilities of piano sound more than Gary Grafman. He yeah. had a beautiful, beautiful sound on the piano. Jan Schulmeister has keyed into that as well, the beautiful lyrical possibilities of the piano, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have chops. He played the Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody number 10 in the semifinals, and this is what it looked like. Jan Schulmeister in the quarterfinals, I should have said, of the 2023 Clyburn Jr. playing the Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody number 10. And of course, he had a virtuoso vehicle just a couple of hours ago in the Saint-Saëns Piano Concerto number two. Moving along to Yifan Wu, the 14-year-old Chinese pianist who today played the Chopin E minor concerto with the Dallas Symphony and Valentina Pelleggi. Here he is in his semi-final recital. He played the complete Opus 25 Etudes of Chopin. Take a look. Those were not the Opus 25 Chopin etudes at all. That was the Barber Sonata, probably. Uh, Yi Fan Wu in the semi-final round played the Barber Sonata, and he played the um, the Brahms Pack, the the second book of Brahms Pack. And I think it was just amazing. It was playing. unbelievable. And he opened with the Couperon, which which we thought was a wonderful choice mm. and really interesting. We 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 spoke off camera mm. about sort of the the uh, resurgence of, of, of their music. It's I think wonderful. that's Grigory Sokolov who's all at fault for- <laughs> Spearheading for, the charge. Uh, he is, he really is. But the I think the pitfalls in playing Couperin on the piano are, are obvious. I mean, it was written for the sort of more ornate sound of the harpsichord and it is, is rife with ornamentation. Right. And so ornamentation sometimes doesn't sound so great 
on the piano, it sounds a little bit not very subtle. And Yifan Wu was able to really integrate that with the sort of lyrical sound of the piano and also the, the piece itself, which was not uh, objective in a way. It was, was very subjective. And then the second book of Brahms Paganini, which made me just sit back like this, it was amazing. It was truly uh, a performance where you, you, there's no, if you heard that performance and somebody were to ask you, you would never guess that this is a 14 year old mm -hmm. kid who's playing it. Mm -hmm. There was not only so much brilliance in it, there was a complete mastery of mm -hmm. the material in mm -hmm. the work, which doesn't come often and certainly almost never comes in a, in a 14 year old. It was truly a staggering display. I it thought. really was, and he's not going for the staggering display. He's really not going for that. He's sure. not. He's not calling attention to the staggering display. He just can do it, yes. which is pretty great. It pretty was great, great music first, <laughs> staggering display second. It was. <laughs> that was exactly the right order. And then, of course, um, the Samuel Barber Sonata for piano, another Curtis alum, Samuel Barber. Yes. Um, that um, an amazing performance, just just full of color and crispness yes and then the fugue my gosh it's very certain player <laughs> um i i there's just something about him that uh, when i think of him the first word that comes to mind is he's a professional mm -hmm. i'm not sure what it is about him perhaps it's his relaxed nature at the keyboard or mm -hmm. just a really deep understanding of the material that he's playing but yes it, it was a, a really direct and very clear performance of the mm -hmm. barbara sonata mm -hmm. All right, that was Yifan Wu. And now we're gonna talk about Sukyung Hong, who is 15 and from um, South Korea. And he is the one who played the Opus 25 Chopin Etudes. Take a look, I'm right this time. Sukyung Hong, of course, was the last competitor to play today with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and Valentina Pileggi. Speaking of the Dallas Symphony, straight ahead, we're going to have an interview with the president and CEO of the Dallas Symphony, a very, very innovative leader named Kim Noltemy. That's straight ahead. But first, we thought you'd like to take a look at Van Cliburn. Here he is. In 1958, Cold War tensions were at their absolute height. Nuclear annihilation was a constant concern. It was against this backdrop of mutual anxiety and suspense that Texas's Van Cliburn emerged, not only winning the first Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow, but ushering in the possibility for a new generation of cultural exchange between the East and the West. The Soviets at that time had just excelled in space and at the Olympics with gold medals and uh, they said, uh, we can even do it in the arts, too. That such a competition would be won by an American, and that's what happened. Van went there. He won over the Russian public. He won over the judges. He played like an angel. I interviewed uh, Vera Gornostaiva, who was a... ...the Moscow Conservatory. And I have a picture in my book of her pointing to her heart. And that was in response to my question, what distinguished man's playing. And I remember perfectly well how barely my father and mother s squeezed me, squeezed me through the crowd uh, because there were no tickets. And I sat on my father's lap and heard Van play Tchaikovsky first piano Mozart. So Van Cliburn came to Russia and brought them back some, uh, some fantasy uh, which Russians lost during this so many tragedies which uh, Russian, Russians went through. I mean, now we refer to him as President Bush, but he was George then. I mean, he said, you know, we're opening the ballpark, and uh, I would like to do something special. Do you have any suggestions? And I said, well, I think one of the best things you could do would be to have Van Cliburn pay, play the national anthem. And he said, well, Van's not gonna do that. He wouldn't do something like that for, you know, for a, a 
baseball game. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to perform our national anthem on opening day at the ballpark in Arlington, please welcome Texas's own Van Cliburn. Joined by the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Maestro John Giordano. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. And I mean, all of a sudden he stops and he gets up and he grabs the microphone. Oh, say, you know, there it is. Whenever I travel to new places, the first thing I start with is the art. What's the art scene like here in Dallas? Thriving. There's music and visual art and theater and dance. A lot of it's right here in the Dallas Arts District. I've been noticing a lot of the architecture out here is incredible. We have four arts buildings, each designed by a different Pritzker Prize winning architect, all right here in the Arts District. Dallas thinks big. Dallas is a bold, new city. There's a spirit of innovation that's happening in the art scene in Dallas right now that is so incredibly exciting. It's not just football and barbecue. Dallas is a world-class innovative art city. A little information about our great artistic partners, the Texas Ballet Theater. We're gonna talk to another one of our great artistic partners in just a minute. But I wanted to let you know that we're moving up the time of the award ceremony. We're going to begin at 5.45 p.m because as promised, Jacques Marquis made the voting happen pretty quickly. All right, we are, we are thrilled to be joined in this segment by the president and CEO of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, which played so beautifully in the finals today, Kim Noltemi. Welcome to the webcast. We are so happy to have you today. Thank you, what a thrill to be here. <laughs> and the Dallas Symphony, of course, acquitted itself beautifully in the finals this afternoon. We were, we were so thrilled with your participation this time and also four years ago. Yes. Just been great. You've been such an innovative leader with the Dallas Symphony. And of course, I'm sure they're never letting you leave town ever. Um, but what I've been so struck by and impressed with is, is your community initiatives, if I can put it that way. There's, a, there's even a program named after you now, the Kim Noltemi Young Musicians Program. Can you give us a little bird's eye view of that because it's so meaningful, I think. Sure, well, yes, it was the greatest honor of my life for the board to raise funds and then name the program after me. Um, it is an El Sistema-like program uh, in Southern Dallas, and we give children in uh, six after-school programs free instruments and in eight to 12 hours of music lessons a week. They learn to read and write, and it's really an orchestral program at heart. They play together, and they have come so far since we founded the program in 2019. 
Um, and then of course we had to do it remotely during COVID. And this year we've had a full school year of incredible mm -hmm. concerts and rehearsals and they can play music that kids, you know, studying for 10 years are still learning to play. And it's uh, just a thrill to see them. They, everyone who comes and visits cries because it's so moving. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really feel like we're making a huge impact on these families' lives. We have 700 children in the program right now. And El Sistema, of course, started in Venezuela, and it really has been transformative. When you say it transforms people's lives, it really is doing that. It really does change lives. So we, when we talk about music as an agent of social change, this is what we're talking about, not, not just a uh, you know, here is a concert for you, but really this, you're going to see us every week and you do this every day kind right. of thing. That is, that is what really makes the change happen. And I think you also said something about the being together. Mm -hmm. That's such a big part of it mm -hmm. for these kids. It's just so valuable. The DSO, though, is all over town always. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You're not sure. just here at the Myers Center. Yes. You're everywhere. Um, you know, we want the Dallas Symphony to feel like every everyone's orchestra, and what that means is meeting people where they are. And so we have concerts in front of grocery stores, chamber music concerts, and we also partner with the concert truck, which is this really cool truck that becomes a stage with lights and sounds and, um, and two pianists that come with it to play with <laughs> our musicians. And that, that um, collaboration plus our musicians playing chamber music all over the place from the Arboretum in the zoo to um, your cul-de-sac, your friendly neighborhood music lover can call us and ask if we will play and we will. And um, we have literally done 200 to 300 concerts a year this way, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing to do 200, 300 concerts outside that are totally free. Again, that's sort of walking the walk, right? Mm -hmm. It really is. Uh, you, what I've been so impressed with this year, the few times I've come to the Dallas Symphony, is the really healthy size of the crowd, you know? All over the country and perhaps the world, that has been a concern this concert season, that, that post-COVID people did not return in the same numbers. You seem to have cracked that code here in Dallas, at least the times I was there. What's your secret? that well, you can tell us on the air. I mean, I think we're <laughs> we're recovering more quickly because during COVID, we did have concerts happening pretty much every week in the Meyerson and also we did all of those free concerts outside that I mm -hmm. mentioned. That started in a big way during COVID. And so I think we connected with a lot of people, new audience members as well as the existing audience members and they felt like we were there for them in their time of need. And you know, we had all kinds of strict protocols between masks and testing and spatial distancing and all of that, but still, they got to hear great music. Fabio got, came in from Europe and conducted his full season, did not miss a concert. And you know, we did all of that and I think people appreciated it and are showing the loyalty mm -hmm. because of that. Just great stories all around from the Dallas Symphony. Kim Noltemi, thank you so thank much for you. being with us. Kim Noltemi is the visionary leader of the Dallas Symphony, its president and CEO, and it's been great to talk to her about connection. We've been talking a lot in this webcast about the festival that goes along with this competition. Here's a little bit more information about that. Take a look. When we created the Junior, the important thing was that it was a learning experience for the young pianist. The Clyburn Junior is not only a competition, it's also a festival. Jacques Marquis thought it was super important for there to be this educational and sort of social aspect. Master classes, community concerts, seminars, workshop on stagecraft, social media, career strategy, etiquette. They have access to these really great people. The artistic director of Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center, Wu Han, came in and talked for a couple of days. The Clyburn has always been in my mind as a pianist 
This is the most admired competition. I'm here because I love music. My hope for these young musicians is they will continue to love music. There are performance opportunities. It's not just a lab. Concerts here on the campus. And then there are these community events in which you're playing for a, a wholly different kind of audience. But that's another teaching moment because a lot of what you do as a musician is in trying to attract an audience. It's different than when you practice in your practice room or even play for your teacher. To have these extra performances opportunity in many, many different venues, nothing like experience special organization like the Clyburns that makes a tremendous amount of difference and impact to see the community gather together to support classical music, to see the encouragement um, they have invest into the future generation and the, the energy and the love they instill in these young musicians gives me such joy and hope knowing that classical music will have a great future. I've said a lot that this is one of the happiest things we do, and it might be the very happiest thing that we do. A festival like this provides them the environment that they can be around like-minded kids. It's a community that are incredibly supportive. You know, when you see so many talent in one place, you just want to make sure that you provide them the opportunity because you know they will make the world a better place. We create an atmosphere of, of sharing and learning. As promised, a little more info about the festival, which is such an integral and important part of what we do at the Clyburn International Junior Festivities here in 2023. One of the students you saw in that video is now sitting with me right here. He is 16-year-old Akilan Sankaran. Uh, from New Mexico, and we're going to talk to him just a little bit about his experiences since June the 8th. Welcome, Kilan. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you. Okay, so in your real life, what all do you do? Um, so I'm very much interested in piano, mm -hmm. but aside from piano, it's kind of a juggling act, and I do enjoy to juggle, so that's that's <laughs> one of the other activities I do, and I'm very interested Wait, in Wait, you really do juggle? Yes, I try juggling. Oh, <laughs> and, are you uh, good? I'm okay, yes. Wow, I, 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 when did you start? I started uh, a few summers ago in like a, a summer camp, actually, and I was really into it, and um, I can just juggle like three balls at a time, maybe four sometimes, and maybe some, you know, some bowling pins if I feel like it, well, but yes. So, <laughs> I, before we leave the subject of juggling, I've never gotten to talk to a juggler before oh. was it like is it like practicing the piano in that you're terrible at the beginning and then you just get a little bit better and then a little bit better is it incremental yes I think all the activities I'm very interested in are uh, they reward dedication and they reward practice and so juggling is really difficult at the beginning you're you know you're throwing one ball and you don't know where the other mm. ball is going to come in. Just like you play one passage and you don't know how the other passage is going to connect. <laughs> and when you're doing a math problem, you don't really know where to start with your proof. But all of these things kind of reward just practice and dedication. And that's really the only way to improve in these things. That's a very good message. I believe that. Uh, it's served me in pretty good stead for almost yeah. 60 years now. <laughs> okay. okay, let's talk about piano. I want to get to math too, but okay, let's great. talk about piano. How yes. old were you when you started? I was, uh, I believe, six years old when I started. Mm -hmm. I was actually inspired by my sister. She played a concert in this Robertson's violin shop and uh, she was That's only a very famous violin shop actually. <laughs> oh really? Okay. We all know what that is here because so many people from the Dallas and Fort Worth Symphony send their uh, fiddles to be worked on at that very oh. shop. So oh, really? we all know what that is here. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, my sister played a concert there and she was only three years old. She's younger than me. And I was so inspired. I was like, I want to be on that stage. A little bit jealous, but also inspired. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to start at, U at the University of New Mexico. I started taking lessons. And eventually I got, I got really into it. I started Moonlight with Moonlight Sonata. I know that sounds very cliche. Um, well, I didn't start with that, but I saw it on the internet. I printed out the score and I told my teacher, what is this little, what is this little marking here? It was actually a double sharp. And mm -hmm. I was like, what is this marking? And she was like, oh, it's double sharp. And she explained it to me. I was like intrigued. I was like, wow, you can change the value of the note by adding these little accidentals and things. Mm -hmm. And I was like really into it, kind of trying different things. And then I got with my current teacher when I was, I believe, eight or nine, I think mm -hmm. nine. And I've been studying with him ever since. He's well, so Well, that seems to be working so. out pretty yes, well. I absolutely. mean, here you are. So yes. anyway, okay. So how does your day go then? 
I mean, you have school, right? Yes, absolutely. And then when does piano fit into all that? Oh, it's so hard to predict, honestly. I will try to do piano in the morning if I can before I go to school. Um, after, so like at five in the morning? Oh, or no, I don't want to. Six in Ooh, the morning? Just like seven, maybe an hour oh, or okay. so. Yeah, right. I try to take frequent breaks in my piano playing mm. and I have to get my sleep. So I'm more of a late night mm -hmm. person. So what I do is after school, I'll go for a run. I'm a, you know, I'm a very avid mm -hmm. runner and I think running often helps balance these other activities and it actually complements them because I can think about piano, like a piano piece or a math problem while running, but I can mm -hmm. also use those to get me through running too. Right. And so I'll run and then about like 5.30, I'll get home, start my homework, and I'll intersperse piano with my math homework, with my extra math activities, and kind of intersperse all of them throughout the night so that I'm not like focusing for like too long on just doing piano, but I'm also like, you know, doing other things at the same time. Okay, so math, when did that yes. get to be a thing with you? Um, I was interested in math in elementary school, but it was really in sixth grade when I went to my current school. I, it's a six through 12 school, Albuquerque Academy. And I met this teacher named Dr. Metzler, Dr. David Metzler, and he's such an amazing teacher. I mean, he's put so much work and dedication into helping me and into helping his students. And I, you know, I took my first class with him and I went to math club and extracurricular activity with him. And I was so inspired. I was like, you know, he makes math seem feel so natural and see it so intuitive. And it feels like it's not just a bunch of numbers and symbols. It's not like in piano, it's not just a bunch of notes on the page. It's actual, like he's painting a picture in your head that when you, when you deal with like, abstract proofs it's actually like you know drawing a picture or like explaining to someone a formula one race I don't know he explains it using so great metaphors so the so. beauty uh, and logic of math sort of become apparent yes when you have a teacher to light it up for you yes like that. absolutely and mm -hmm. I he's um, supervised a couple of research projects that I that I did on the ABC conjecture which is an unsolved problem in number theory and highly divisible numbers mm -hmm. in the spirit of the Indian mathematician Ramanujan and both of those things uh, he supervised and gave me guidance throughout the way not too much so that that he was like, you know, enforcing like which way should I go, but also enough so that I would have the theoretical base to kind of build upon that and mm -hmm. do my own unique research, which was mm -hmm. great. So, That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So tell me what is Math Club? Oh, Math I see Club. It, I see it in a lot of bios. I've always wanted to ask. And now I have somebody I can ask, what is math club? Well, I think it differs on, you know, which kind of math club you're thinking about. But I think it's just a bunch of, you know, a bunch of kids, it could be adults too, who are really interested in math as, you know, as recreational and not like, you know, very theoretical stuff, but recreational. Just like, oh, what's interesting about math for you? Mm -hmm. What's interesting about math for you? So we have that in our school. And it's mostly people in my current math class um, because we're all very interested in, mm -hmm. um, in mathematics outside of school. Sometimes we'll do like contests and contest problems, but other times we'll just chat about math. Like for example, there are these um, mathematical games, like a NIM, where you can like, you know, take M&Ms and try to strategically take them from piles. And then whoever um, ha has like, the last one to take an M&M wins. And you can eat the M&Ms on the way, so that's also fun. Wow, awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna switch gears sort of okay. violently, but I wanna ask you what you've been doing at the festival here. Oh, the festival has been so much fun. So I think for me, it's had three aspects so far. The first is master classes. So um, they've had you know a master class pretty much every day of the festival. I had mine with Stanislav Udenich. You might recognize him um, from the 2001 <laughs> yeah. Clyburn. Yeah. And he was you know such an inspiring teacher, What'd very detail oriented. I played Chopin Nocturne Opus 27 number one. Mm -hmm. And as Janina Fielkowska mentioned today in the jury symposium, a Chopin and Nocturne seems quite simple technically, but when you when you deconstruct it musically, it can be so hard, and that's what Udenich was mm -hmm. teaching me about. And so what do you yes. think, what, what was the main thing you got from Stasek in this master class? Um, from the master class, I would say the main thing is to really I think this is this is somewhat obvious sometimes, but it's to really think before you play every note and to make every note have a purpose in achieving the meaning of the piece, right? And not to let any note just go away without hearing its meaning. Because every every note in a Chopin Nocturne, when it's only a six minute piece and you're trying to tell just such a compelling story, I think every note is really critical to that. So mm -hmm. that was the main message. So that was your master class experience. Yes. What else do you guys do? So I think it was here? amazing to play in a recital concert for four of the judges on the jury. What did you play in that? I played a Debussy's with Fred Anlo. I played Prokofiev's Third Sonata and Rachmaninoff's Prelude, his penultimate Prelude in G Sharp Minor. Mm -hmm. And so these three pieces, I felt they had very contrasting styles, and the judges noted that. And I felt it was a great experience to, with not that much pressure, but to play for some amazing judges and get some great feedback. So mm -hmm. I actually talked to them after the master class. I'm still in contact with them, and I think that was the greatest part of it. Is I get so much great feedback. Oh, good. So. This concert, it was a concert, right? Yes, Did it was you, a okay. formal concert. So yes. it was on the stage of Caruth Auditorium? Yes, yes. Oh, it was great to play awesome. there as well. That yes. is awesome. So the same stage where 
the competitors were playing at SMU, you were playing this. Yes, and the same. As well. Yes, and for the same judges as well. And mm -hmm. um, I really need to thank uh, the Clyburn for giving me that mm -hmm. opportunity. So, who all did you get to talk to after the concert that was on our um, jury panel? Here? So, I talked to the four judges who judged my concert. So, Orion Weiss, mm -hmm. um, Anton Nell, um, Jane Cope, Coop, I think, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, the last one was Roberto Plano, oh, and all of them were so kind, so oh, I really appreciate them. Well, yeah. it, maybe also you played well. They might not have just been being kind. It's perfectly possible that you played really well, Thank right? Thank you. I appreciate okay, that. Good. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Also, I think the third really important experience was a community concert, which we gave at a library, mm -hmm. and I gave it with uh, six other festival artists, and I played a couple of, you know, short, small pieces, but it was just so much fun bringing a smile to everyone's face with music in the library. So. Okay, so we have a whole audience of pianists out here, so what did you play in that concert, though? Want to know? I played Chopin's Etude, Opus 25, Number 7, commonly referred to as the cello etude, but I like to refer to, refer to it as a string quartet etude, since there's so many voices and I played also that Rachmaninoff prelude that I played in my in my festival mm -hmm. concert. Yeah. So the awards are just about to happen. Yes, it's a pretty it's exciting so time, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's been fantastic to meet all the competitors. You though. don't have to tell me who it is. In fact in fact it's better if you don't yes, tell me probably. who it is, but do you have a favorite? Um, I, I will say I I have a favorite. I probably don't want to tell you who it is. Good, but, good. It's um, better if you don't. But it was but the first person I met one. when I got here. So oh, I think that's wow. somewhat biased and he was so kind to me and um, uh, I'm just so inspired by him, and all of the competitors mm -hmm. have been so inspiring, and I, it's so great to learn from them and to talk to them about things, both musical and non-musical. Have you had the experience of playing with an orchestra? Yeah. Uh, yes, oh, I had good. the great pleasure of playing with the New Mexico Philharmonic just a few weeks before I came here. Oh, so, wow. What did you do? I played Rachmaninoff's second piano piece. Oh, there. fantastic. Yes, it was so that much That is fun. fantastic. Yeah. Okay, we wish you well in everything you are involved in, which is a lot. I don't see when you sleep or Thank eat, you so much. but you've got a lot going on. Uh, yes, hopefully I can keep juggling. <laughs> I think you can, plus the juggling, right? Yes. Akira and Sankaran, who is a 16-year-old from Albuquerque, who has joined us in this intermission break. We are just moments away from the awards ceremony, but we want to let you know a little bit more about the whole junior competition experience. Here's a little walk and talk with Jacques Marquis, the president and CEO of the Clyburn. Take a look. I'm Jacques Marquis. I'm the president and CEO of the Clyburn. And we're here today at Caruth Auditorium on the campus of SMU in Dallas for the beginning of the Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. One of the key things of this junior competition is they are between 13 and 17 years old and we want this to be a learning journey for them. We're here in the Caruth Auditorium where we'll have the first three rounds of the competition. It's a great hall, perfect for recital. They will all play on this very nice Steinway D. The jury will be here and we have nine members of the jury coming from all over the world. And from round to round, they will decide who they want to listen again in the next round. The system is very simple. It's a yes, no process without deliberation and discussion. We have the practice rooms and you can hear some of them practicing already. Like I said before, they practice a lot and they've been practicing a lot. To prepare for a competition of that level, they have to practice Piano is a very solo instrument, and they come here and we, we bring them together as a Clyburn camp. They will leave with friendships, new knowledge, new ideas, and we'll see how they can blossom through that. The competition itself is not a finality. It's we're trying to not close any windows. We try to open them all. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take you to the stage now for the award ceremony at this 2023 Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the award ceremony of the 2023 
Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festivals. To make the award tonight, please help me welcome to the stage Clyburn Chairman of the Board, Jeff King. <laughs> Clyburn President and CEO, Jacques Marquis. Touring pianist and touring pianist laureate of the inaugural Rubenstein Master Piano Competition, winner of Canada's 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award in Classical Music, and chairman of the jury of the 2023 Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival from Canada, Yanina Fielkowska. And now, the members of the jury. From Canada, concert pianist and professor of piano at the University of British Columbia's School of Music, Jane Coop. <laughs> Representing the United States and Poland, touring pianist and winner of the China Shanghai International Piano Competition, the Gilmore Young Artist Award, and the American Pianist Association Fellowship, Adam Golka. From the United States, concert pianist and chair of piano studies and professor of piano at SMU's Meadows School of the Arts, Carol Leone. Representing South Africa and the United States, concert pianist, winner of the Nomberg International Piano Competition, and head of keyboard studies at the University of Texas at Austin, Anton Nell. <laughs> From Italy, touring pianist, winner of the Cleveland International Piano Competition, and finalist of the 2005 Van Cliburn International Piano Competition, Roberto Plano. <laughs> Representing Greece and Russia, touring pianist and finalist of the 1997 Van Cliburn International Piano Competition, Katya Skanavi. From the United States, concert pianist, professor of piano at New York University, gold medalist of the Queen Elizabeth competition, and bronze medalist of the 1977 Van Cliburn International Piano Competition, Jeffrey Swan. And from the United States, Touring pianist and recipient of the Gilmore Young Artist Award and Avery Fisher Career Grant, Orion Weiss. Now please welcome to the podium, Clyburn Chairman of the Board, Jeff King. Good afternoon. What a magical time we've spent together during this third Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition. I believe you'll agree, after enjoying these performances today and over the course of the past two weeks, that the future of classical music is in good hands. <laughs> Watching these young people come together from across the globe and become friends with one another, you get the impression that peace and understanding among all people and across all nations is actually within our reach. This entire festival has been a celebration not only of wonderful music, but of our common human experience as expressed through our only true shared language, music. Van Cliburn said, if you hold on to the beauty and inspiration and the 
clarity that is music, you will always have an anchor and you will not be swayed by the world. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I wish to express our deepest gratitude to our donors and sponsors, our volunteers, our wonderful staff, and all of you who joined us today and throughout the past two weeks in person and online. Special thanks goes to our esteemed international jury, our wonderful conductor, Valentina Pelleggi of Italy, and the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And to SMU and Sam Holland and the Meadows School, what wonderful hosts you have been again. We plan on many more of these if you'll have us. And finally, it is my honor to express our deepest gratitude for each of these young people and their families, their teachers, and their communities as they brought the best of themselves and in so doing allowed us to imagine the best of ourselves as well. This has been a blessing for us all. Thank you. Please welcome Clyburn President and CEO, Jacques Marquis. They are really nice. <laughs> Thank you, audience. Uh, people who came to the concerts here at the Meyerson today at SMU. Uh, we need people to follow these Fantastic artists, thank you for being with us. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsor of this concert. It's Larry Broder, architect and pencil, print construction, and you can clap now. <laughs> Talking about audience, we're at 1.2 million views in 122 countries. It's gonna grow. Uh, just when you think of time zone, the other uh, part of the planet Earth is sleeping now. They will wake up and they will watch the webcast. Then we'll see the numbers coming up. I would like to thank especially here the sponsor of the webcast. And this is, you saw it, uh, Texas Ballet Theater. Uh, they are a fantastic ballet company working here in Dallas and in Fort Worth. And with the Clavin, we do the same. And we like to think that we bridge these two wonderful cities together. Then thank you for Anne and Bob Bass for doing that. And thank you to the Texas Valley Theater for being sponsor of the webcast. <laughs> we said before, thank you to SMU. I like their attitude. There's a problem, they will fix it. They have a yes attitude, which is great. It's wonderful to play with the DSO for you guys, it was, I'm sure, wonderful. And, and with Valentina also, thank you so much to be here at the Meyerson. My jury, thank you so much. It's been wonderful working with them and they were caring about every musician and I make them work a lot of taking, taking all the notes because we will send all the comments of the jury to the candidates and it will be precious for them in the future. Thank you so much for your help. I'm almost done. A big part of the Clabern is the volunteers, and they've been everywhere, 125-ish volunteers, uh, transportation to the airport, and helping with the jury, with food, and all that. And thank you, the volunteers, to make this competition so efficient we cannot do that without you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Part of the volunteers, naturally, are Clavern Board. I think they're, I think as them as being workers for me, but they are volunteers at, at the end of the day. Thank you also, the Clavern Board, for supporting everything we do at the Clavern, especially this wonderful program of the Junior. And before talking about these wonderful guys right there, thank you to the parents for making this happen. This is great. <laughs> thank you to the counselors 
to have been working with them for a week. They're fantastic pianists. They're also teenagers. You need people to watch after them. <laughs> then it's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, it's been a privilege to have you with us. We. I said it many times, you inspire us. And anytime you want to come back, we'll be here for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Last thank you, it's for the club and staff. We had a wonderful year of doing three competitions in one year. The professional competitions in June 22, a year ago, was the concert of Yun Chan Lim is Rack 3. The amateur competition we did in October and the junior, then I think I would give them the weekend off and we can start the next one. The next one would be 25. Thank you so much. I have the best staff in the arts world. Thank you so much. Please welcome Janina Fialkowska. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to announce the awards. Uh, as you know, I was a competitor myself once about 100 years ago in, in international competitions. And I know that keeping you in suspense for the awards is unnatural and cruel behavior. So I won't. But just permit me just to thank, give two thank yous, OK? The first thank you goes to Jacques, you. And to, and to all your staff for making our life really so much fun. I mean, it's very hard and very stressful to be a juror because we do care and it's hard, but you made it bearable and fun and I thank you. And there's one other person that the jury members will agree with me, our den mother and our nanny, uh, Katie Heltzel. And the other thank you I want to do is to my fellow jurors. You are a very, very distinguished bunch of people. You're professional. As I said before, you care, which is absolutely beautiful. You are amazingly hardworking and amazingly knowledgeable. And I learned a lot being with you. And it's been an honor and a privilege being your chairperson. So thank you. And now the awards. In addition to the prizes awarded tonight, three non-advancing semifinalists will all receive a cash award of $2,000 each. Now, first up, the audience award, determined by more than 4,500 online votes from viewers around the world, and it comes with a cash prize of $500. The audience award goes to Suk Young Hong. the top three awards. In addition to cash prizes, the three finalists will each receive a $2,500 scholarship to be used towards artistic advancement over the next year. The Hortau Family third prize comes with a cash award of $5,000. And the third prize goes to Jan Schulmeister.
The Shirley Cox McIntyre second prize comes with a cash award of $10,000. And the second prize goes to Yifan Wu. And the, the Bernice Gressman Meyerson first prize comes with a cash award of $15,000. And the first prize goes to Suk Yung Hong. Thank you. We'll be back here in 2027, and the next Clyburn will be 2025, and I'm sure I'm going to see some of you. <laughs> Take care, all. Have a great Father's Day. There are three young fellows on the stage looking happy and also looking relieved, don't you think, Daniel Shu? Absolutely. It must be such a relief to get to the end of this incredible marathon mm -hmm. for them. Well, you know that firsthand, don't you? I mean, I was there relief at the awards ceremony? Absolutely. It was, mm -hmm. a, it, was a, it was a mix of a lot of different emotions, mm -hmm. but relief was certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. Well, you did pretty well. I mean, I hope you were happy at the awards. I show. was. I was. These guys are to the third prize, Jan Schulmeister from Czechia, 16 years old. The second prize, 14 years old Chinese pianist Yifan Wu, and the grand prize winner, the Morton, the Bernice Meyerson grand prize, goes to Sagyong Hong, a 15 year old pianist from South Korea, who gave that brilliant performance of Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini. Here they are being congratulated by jurors. You've been through this part too, right? <laughs> I've been through this part two, walking through the line, saying hello to all of these incredible pianists that you finally get to talk to now oh, that right. you're done at the competition. I didn't think about that part. You get to talk to them finally. Yes, you do. So did you, do, did you meet some of your own heroes at the end in 2017? I absolutely did. <laughs> um, it, was, it was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. There were some amazing pianists and sort of inspiring figures in the jury, mm -hmm. as, as there always is. Mm -hmm. Jock always puts together a good, good band. He does, and there, are, there they are, still on stage. And that wraps it up for this 2023 edition of the Clyburn International Junior Piano Competition and Festival. Daniel Shu, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. For it's being been so much fun. Us. Especially today, you came in real handy talking about <laughs> music when we had an hour and a half to kill. I'm Buddy Bray. Join us again in two years for the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition in Fort Worth. Take care. We'll see you soon.